count to three. Now blink. In less time than that, somewhere between two frames, the sky seems to have duplicated itself. One emerald traveler became two near Mars, and every instrument that could turn in time caught the afterimage of a moment we didn't see. If that doesn't jolt you, the numbers will. It started as a smudge. Zwicky transient facility swept its grid, and a few arc seconds off three I atlases predicted path, a faint point kept showing up where there shouldn't be one. One image is a glitch, two is a coincidence, three, with the same offset and the same motion, is a problem for the status quo. MPC analysts tore through astrometry, remeasured centroids, scrubbed hot pixels, and sanity checked timestamps. NASA's scout triaged it out of maybe and into watch this. By dawn in Chile, bigger glass was awake. Gemini South logged it, SALT logged it, a VLTQ slot got bumped. Different detectors, different nights, same faint companion, same lockstep motion. And the part that still feels impolite? Whatever happened, happened between frames. Inside a slice so thin that standard rolling shutters and difference imaging pipelines slide right past it. Orbit solutions converged anyway, because gravity doesn't care about drama. Even with barycentric corrections, the fits stayed hyperbolic. Eccentricity greater than one, V infinity above zero. In non-jargon, this visitor isn't bound to our sun. The geometry put Atlas around 1.4 astronomical units from Mars. Far from a solar furnace, far from any Jupiter-class tide, spectra explained the glow. The familiar swan bands of C2 near 516 nanometers, a CN, whisper in the violet around 388 nanometers, and, intriguingly, hints of CO slash CO plus emissions. Then came the eyebrow razor, Nickel and cobalt lines a touch louder than you'd expect for a coma this small. A chemistry quirk that's rare, but not impossible. Polarimetry added another twist. Dust grains looked aligned, not random, as if magnetic fields or flow structure were combing the coma. The tail stayed tighter than simple models prefer. Order, where we expected mess. That was the second jolt. Now, comets split. Shoemaker-Levy 9 is the Hall of Fame case, Jupiter's gravity tore it into a bead necklace in 1992. Astronomers have witnessed five massive explosions on the planet Jupiter as fragments from the shoemaker Levy collided with the planet. Larger explosions are expected later this week. They called it the biggest explosion in the solar system for hundreds of years. Half an hour after the first comet fragment went in, the impact was still visible. The cloud of debris spread out for thousands of miles and was over a thousand miles high. The astronomers were jubilant. We're going to see things and we're going to learn a lot. That's the good news tonight. Then those beads slammed into the planet and wrote textbooks in fire. Thermal splits happen too, when pockets of volatile ice heat up and pop near the sun. But neither script fits neatly here. Mars doesn't have Jupiter's grip, and at 1.4 astronomical units, you're not exactly broiling. Could deeply buried CO2 and CO caverns vent after eons at interstellar deep freeze? Could stress cycles from spin and sunlight eventually pry a clump loose, maybe. That's why observers pulled out the classic diagnostics. AFR to measure dust production, Marsden A1 slash A2 slash A3 to capture tiny jetting accelerations and rotation state from light curve inversions. Then the math started talking back. Back of the envelope thermal fits, tied to mid-IR estimates and visible flux, hint at power densities that make engineers shift in their chairs. Gigawatt class is the phrase that floats around, with the all-caps caution it deserves. The Stefan Boltzmann law doesn't lie, but emissivity, area, and beaming can. Still, the tension is real. A small radiating area, a hot signal, and not enough surface to hide business as usual. Meanwhile, 
photometry kept teasing a faint, approximately 11 Hz flicker in some stacks. That could be spin modulation, it could be cyclic jetting, or it could be a system turning on and off in a pattern we don't yet understand. If it's sunlight doing the pushing, accelerations should neatly fall off as 1 over R squared, with YORP-like torques slowly nudging spin. If it's something else, you expect a curve that doesn't care as much about distance, and you look for synchronized changes across both bodies that scream, shared control. Cue the fight. The conservative read says, natural fragment train. A cohesive nucleus sheds a clump. Both pieces ride the parent trajectory. Over days to weeks, the formation decorrelates. Spectra drift as different ices wake, and the light curves meander. The bold read says, engineered drop. A parent arrives, releases a child tuned for inner system sampling, and the pair hold station far longer than rubble should. If that's true, one signature jumps to the front of the line. Narrow band radio near water hydrogen's magic number, 1,420 megahertz. Some stations murmured about fleeting pings in that neighborhood. A DSN dish logged a small, suspicious bump in system temperature. A timing cluster saw a nanosecond-scale jitter ripple that came and went. None of it is peer-reviewed. All of it has to run the RFI gauntlet. But if even one carrier survives calibration, the center of gravity of this story moves. Mars, meanwhile, has practical worries. MRO, MAVEN, and ESA's ExoMars TGO operate on orbits you can't casually tweak every time the headlines spike. Even pebble-scale debris is a math problem at interstellar speeds. JPL folded shoemaker levy lessons into models, then subtracted Jupiter's tides and painted in Martian gravity and solar conditions. So far, trajectory residuals hug predictions. No wild scatter, no hair on fire alerts. But the dust environment matters. If the fragment keeps shedding, Mars's upper atmosphere could get a transient veil of particulates that makes imaging noisy for a bit. That's a schedule headache, not a catastrophe. But in space ops, schedule is oxygen. Who's actually watching, and what can they see? Hubble and JWST are brilliant and hamstrung at the same time. Sun angle rules keep them out of the most dramatic geometry. Soho and Stereo, the solar sentries, can catch tail structure and solar wind wrestling matches that ground scopes miss. Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter map the wind shaping those tails. Magnetic switchbacks, density holes, the kind of features that align grains and pinch Kome. Bepi Colombo's magnetometers add context if the angles line up. On the ground, VLT, Keck, Gemini, SALT, and a dozen national facilities leapfrog nights, chasing CN slash C2 ratios, nickel line evolution, and phase curve polarization swings. During high interest events, more teams are pushing raw spectra into open repositories ahead of print, because planetary defense modelers can't wait for journals to breathe. Here's the part that can settle arguments quickly. Test one. Does the acceleration obey 1 over R squared like radiation pressure? Or does it flatten like thrust? Test 2. Do both bodies show synchronized light curve phases or simultaneous spectral flips, as if one switch was thrown? Test 3. Does a narrow band carrier near 1420 megahertz reappear with the right Doppler drift across multiple sites and instruments after ruthless RFI scrubs? Test 4. Does the formation hold tight through perihelion without number creep? No new pieces budding off. No slow fan out that rubble favors. Four tests. Four ways for nature or intent to sign their name. All of this lands inside a living context. Humuamua sprinted through in 2017 without a coma and with a pesky non-gravitational acceleration that still fractures conferences. Hydrogen ice block, nitrogen shard, Dust Bunny Fractal, Light Sail Hypothesis, Pick Your Poison, None Are Slam Dunks. Then 2i slash Borisov arrived in 2019 and behaved like a textbook comet with weird chemistry. CO Rich, Nickel Traces, but no fragmentation and no formation games. Those two set expectations. Weird is allowed, splitting is rare. 3i Atlas just elbowed those expectations. 
and now we're all staring at the bruise. This is also a stress test for how fast we can move. The planetary defense world has been drafting rapid response protocols for years. This is the live fire drill. Data sharing pipelines that used to drip now have to pour. Impact probability code needs to ingest spectra, photometry, and dust proxies in near real time, not weeks later. Policy memos are finally catching up, pushing open astrometry and spectra during high interest windows. So no single team sits on a critical piece by accident. If you care about getting humans to Mars in one piece, this is the homework you can't skip. And because we're gluttons for hard problems, the Intercept crowd showed up too. A stripped-down solar Oberth dive with a solid kickstage could fling a tiny payload into the coma faster than polite budgets like. Pop the fairing and you release a shoal of CubeSats. One sniffs volatiles with a mass spectrometer. One reads dust mineralogy. One maps fields. One pings for reflectors and passive scatterers. Heat shields, calm and navigation make this a nightmare. But a small truth bomb delivered up close beats a thousand speculative papers from afar. Even if it misses this window, the design time is a down payment on the next interstellar guest. So what's actually on the table? Scenario A, a rare, inconvenient, natural split from a nucleus with odd interstellar chemistry, CO slash CO2 rich layers, metallized crusts, and dust that aligns in a structured solar wind, teaching us how little we know about deep cold material physics. Scenario B, a deliberate drop-off we happen to catch. With tight station keeping, synchronized behaviors, and maybe a whisper near 1420 megahertz once the RFI is scrubbed clean. Both scenarios demand the same immediate posture, measure everything, publish fast, and let predictions fight in daylight. Here's what to watch next if you want to call the shot before the papers land. The acceleration curve, Open your notebook and sketch one over R squared. If reality refuses to trace it, pay attention. The polarization angle. If grains keep snapping to attention at phase angles that don't track dust models, fields are in charge. The nickel cobalt lines. If they brighten and fade in sync across both bodies, that's a shared engine of some kind, chemical or otherwise. The 11 Hertz flicker. If it stays, phase locks, or propagates from one body to the other. That's a signature with teeth. And if a narrowband carrier returns with Doppler shifts that match the orbit fits, well, you'll hear the collective inhale from here. Meanwhile, the clock is cruel. Perihelion squeezes the timeline. Speeds spike. Small errors grow claws. If the pair hold rank through the bend around the sun, that's not rubble behavior. If they fan out and drift, that's the decorrelation we've seen a hundred times from fragments. Either way, the next data drop isn't going to be polite. The solar wind is rowdy this cycle. Parker's seen switchbacks that can twist a tail into braids. If you want live physics, this is as live as it gets. So, one became two in a blink near Mars, and the universe didn't wait for us to be ready. The safe bet is always, nature is weirder than we modeled, and I'll take that bet any day. But the honest position is to let the sky answer. Does sunlight write the acceleration? Or does something else hold the pen? Do the spectra wander like different ices waking up? Or pivot together like a switch was thrown? Do we hear silence? Or a narrow voice at a very old frequency? We won't vote this mystery into submission. We'll measure it. Drop your best read below. Natural fragment train with exotic ices and a talent for bad timing. A deliberate drop we caught by accident or two wanderers crossing paths while we argue under a dome of air. Subscribe if you want the prediction scoreboard in the next upload, because the only thing better than a mystery like this is watching it choose a side in real time. And don't blink. The last time we did, the sky changed the rules between frames.